So <coughs> when we look at uh, when we the, the the introduction of all flash array, that we find many challenges. Challenges, for example, we when we are actually looking at the traditional array. Suppose this is our base performance uh, performance baseline. When we're adding features more and more, it turns out to be we keep getting decreased in performance. So, for example, after we add inline compression, we get percentage off. Then, if, with inline duplication, it's even more. And with snapshot and with metro cluster. So, that makes it make everything worse is the famous that the, the SSD, the GC kicks in. So, what we're trying to ad address that is using uh, architecture which is optimized in a way that we don't suffer those losses. So when you look at our baseline, our baseline is with 80% utili space utilization and with GC kicked in. So what's we, GC? Garbage, garbage collection. collection. That means the SSD internal GC. We also using our um, the redirect on write so that we don't suffer any performance loss with read 5, read 6, or read TP. TP stands for triple parity. <coughs> then we, after we add inline compression, we do have an overhead. And we, when we add inline deduplication, also have a little bit overhead. Snapshot is free, and metric cluster, a little overhead. So this, the numbers, to the best of my drawing skill. So this numbers is actually relative true to each other. So why did the why did the Dorado one start with more performance? Damn it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, because it's uh, only design in that way. Uh, some difficulty here on this side of the table. Sure. Um, yeah. So this is our Dorado architecture. It's quite conventional in the sense that we still have the target, replication snapshot, none management. Then we have cache and the route. After that, below that, we have deduplication engine and compression engine. Then the metadata management. This is where most of the change happens. Then we optimize our data layout to fit SSDs. And underlying, we have a very optimized infrastructure as well. So this is one controller. So every enclosure, we call that engine. It has two controllers inside. Then they're connected using PCI Express. And multiple engines can actually co co collaborate we also use PCI Express to connect all the engines. So this is the overview of our architecture. <clears throat> so then I will describe the write flow, read flow. Then I will describe the internal um, data structures. Sorry, can you, can you go back? So the engine, so your engines are connected through PCI, or I'm sorry, PCIe. Uh, yeah. And then you're, so that's like within each controller or the actual engines are? So when you look at the particular enclosure right there, yeah. the two engine, two controllers here yeah. in one enclosure. Right. Then when you connect multiple, you use PCIe cables to, or ah, okay. to, to connect them. So and, 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 and the storage is a NVMe storage as well. So it's also PCIe connected to each of the engines. Um, this <coughs> on the, the 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 drives can be either NVMe or SAS. Yeah. Okay. So <coughs> the write flow is actually really simple. We receive from the user. We mirror to the, the other side, which is the con other controller. And, and the then cache we is not volatile. What's that? Cache is non-volatile. Cache is non-volatile. It's memory uh, battery-backed era. Battery-backed era. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
then after we get the dirty, the cache with dirty data, we now have another step, which is asynchronous, means it's background. We flush the, those data to SSD. This I'm trying to describe the inline dedupe flow, means we have the data here, we, we route based on the fingerprint. Then we find the fingerprint shard controller. This two controller can be the same. Shard means just logically it's a, it's a where we find the, <coughs> the fingerprint uh, home shard. Then we're trying to compare the fingerprint as well as the data. <coughs> so if both are matching, we think it's a, it's, we find that duplication. So the reason we use this because we're using a weak hash. Then after we get the fingerprint index, <coughs> we update the non-map shard controller. Then with the fingerprint index for that particular LBA. And after that, it is um, flushed. So the, uh, the, the back end is, is a log structured file system kind of layout, or is it directly addressed? Uh, we use a copy on write on that one. So yes. from a snapshot perspective, copy on write, okay. Yes. Uh, but the, it's not the back end it's the row. devices yeah. themselves? It's, it's, it's the direct on For snapshot, it's redirect on yeah. Sorry. Okay. He was talking. He's, he's. There's a miscommunication. His. He was talking about something other than the snapshot. So snapshots redirect, not yeah. copy. All right. Uh, so the back end again. What is the back end? Is it laid out with a physical LUN assigned to a physical SSD, or is it, you know, is it a log structure file system where the data is written sequentially, even though it's coming in randomly? Um, the data layout is, we, we do also do redirect on write, means it is in, a, we don't erase until we garbage class. Like so in, in a way that it is log structured, but it's not really just one log, it's multiple logs, because okay. in that logic. Couple questions. Yeah. So um, you're flushing out. How how often? What what triggers the flush? Is it timed? Is it based on watermark? It's based on uh, watermark and time. So both, either. Yeah. Uh, and second, when in the, in the previous screens that you don't have to go back, oh. where the controller had uh, you had PCIe and it was going to PCIe to the other controller. Yes. Uh, obviously, there's a card in the PCIe slot, right? What kind of card is in that PCI <laughs> slot that control that connects the controllers for high availability? Oh, that's one of the one of this chip. Oh, is it like InfiniBand or what's the that's what's the PCIe? So what? So you have a, like a PCIe switch or something that's connecting all these together, or do they do that's all the PCI controllers? Switch. Yeah. 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 Switch. Yeah. So actually, it's just it's, it's literally PCI to PCI connectivity. A, no, nothing in between. No, there's no network, no InfiniBand. No, there's a so the the engines are connected together via PCIe switch. So if you only have two engines, you can do point to point, but if there's multiple engines, we have a PC, we have redundant PCIe switches to connect the engines. But in a, in one engine, there's two controllers. So it's the PCIe over the backplane. Right. Connected. So they're literally those, the PCI buses are connected without any network port. It's like, it's not, like other, 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 other controller control. platforms will have InfiniBand or some other in the PCIe slots, and that's how okay. They yeah, yeah, it. yeah. No, it's it's PCIe. So you're actually doing it at bus speeds. Yeah, yes. yeah, between the controllers. Oh, yes. wow, that's cool. Yeah, and, and I'm surprised you guys didn't ask about NVMe over fabric earlier. Well, I mean, <laughs> should we ask guy. about NVMe over fabric? <laughs> we, we assumed there was a slide. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking at the 18,000 18, um, diagram, you can find those ports. case of uh, the deduplication is disabled, it's even simpler. We're just looking at the LBA 
draw to the non map chart controller and persist over there. I mean, persist flushed over there. So when on the read path, what uh, for a dedupled block, by dedupled block means <coughs> we're actually looking at the non map. If the non map is pointing to a fingerprint index, we know that's a dedupled block. For that one, we first route based on the LBA, find the FPI, then use the FPI to route to the physical shard, fingerprint shard, then we read data and reply to the user. For well, NDU block, we're looking at LBA to get to the physical address, which is local on this shard, then we reply to the user. <coughs> so when we look at our design, there are several things we're trying to maximize, maximize our performance. So this is our threading <coughs> model. What we're trying to achieve with <coughs> the threading model is to give you the best performance. So here, we employ a share nothing um, model, which means <coughs> we partition the data structures into fine shards. <coughs> Within each fine shards, we <coughs> have a shard to core binding or affinity, if you like. There we do the lock free, even atomic instruction free operations so that when we're looking at a particular thread level or task, we use also the non preemptive lightweight threading, LWTs, so that the task are run from beginning to end, so run to complete model. So this will minimize the contact switch cost. We also have a highly optimized data path because the SSD is really fast. Here we have optimized data path for read, for compression, and for diff. The, te the technique we, we're using are we extract common blocks So we don't have to, um, so that we can save the redundant computation. <coughs> we also do as much vectorization as we could, so that to extract the instruction level parallelism. We also optimize our branches, for example, here, so that it's become more and more um, um, to ex exploit every possible CPU that we can use. So these are the examples we get from, <coughs> we can achieve with, uh, with our data path. So compared to the open source design and the, the other popular designs, we can achieve something anywhere from 70% uh, to 300%. So for example, the RATP 10 plus 3, we can get 6.5 gigabyte per second with one thread. With algorithm, it's about double the speed of the uh, popular design. We also have 3x design on the diff part. Is that your RATP ratio, 10 plus 3? You don't get bigger than that? No, this is just uh, when we test it. And the TP, uh, you can, user can select. The, the, the read configuration, user can select. <coughs> I need to stay this a bit longer? Uh, I think I'm good. Good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. And also, one key point in our all flash array, array is the de metadata design. The metadata design, we're trying to achieve two objectives. First is optimize for memory so that we can address more uh, flashes. Second one is we try to optimize for parallelism, means we can make it runs 
faster without step on to each other. So what we're doing here is in our um, metadata, first is we're trying to do small grant updates, means that that's <coughs> when you. So, uh, Chin, uh, so the, the optimization algorithms that you have there are because they're no, you know, shared nothing, you know, multi-core, or is it because you've actually implemented new functionality that's actually faster than the old one? LZ4, for instance. We have implemented um, new, faster, new more fast. efficient. Yeah. Yes, but not only that, we also shard to so that we can shard so that it's shared. It's not it's shared nothing between shards. So that's both are actually helping us to get the high performance. Then on these details is we're trying to actually um, minimize the metadata write amplification. What we're trying to do here is we use a small grain. We also update, coalescing the updates. So the inner nodes updates are coalesced together. And we also do a prefix B plus tree here, which we can get be able to address twice the amount of flash. So in line with, this is uh, still, that is trying to see that, how do we optimize for the parallelism? The non-map, we're actually partitioning them into shards, many, many shards, so that it's, they are not interfering with each other. The fingerprint, we also and, partition them. And you're partitioning them. them in shards because, I mean, they're all running on the same <coughs> engine, right? Correct. But it's just the ability <coughs> not to have it be locked? That's correct. If, because if you look at our, this design, because we bind each shard to a particular core so that we can actually have a lock-free and atomic instruction-free operation on them. I got you. Yeah. So the fingerprint is our sharded multiple um, buckets, many, many buckets. Here we have the ability to store variable size fingerprint buckets. This way we can actually resolve the conflict when we're trying to do the hashing. So it's more efficient that way. So here we can see uh, a bucket has a size of four entries, then we can, some entry, some bucket will have size of eight. So those are the uh, op metadata design, trying to optimize for memory. <coughs> Sometimes, even we do all this optimization, we still cannot fit everything, because when you look at modern computers, it has a fixed maximum DRAM. So beyond that, you cannot add more. What we're trying to do here is, with all that memory, we dedicated those memories to cache all the inner nodes. The rest of the memory, we basically will cache the NIF node so that those are cached on demand. So this is another way to, that we can actually optimize for memory. This way, when we're looking at a particular user access, the user access will only have maximum two drive access. This is only when the DRAM is not, um, it's the maximum that a particular platform can, can approach. <coughs> this is another one. This is, when we're looking at the data layout, so that's the metadata. Now we're looking transit to the data layout. We're trying to minimize, uh, we're trying to do all the synergies here. For example, here is, well, we look at the, why we do the COW, the log structured. Um, the, the cost for in-place update is really high if you're looking at an in-place update. So uh, for read five, you put, you have two more, read access and one more extra write, and total I.O. is actually four, then actual I.O. is three. So if you look at 
The ROW design is when we always take one new stripe, yeah. stripe, then copy the data over. So in this way, when you're looking at RE5, RE6, and RETP, we don't have any extra um, IOs. So that's the, and also, this way is very friendly for SSD, so that it's, um, mm, you can actually uh, utilize all the SSD bandwidth. <coughs> Sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? So you're saying that the rate penalty, <coughs> rate 5, rate 6, and rate TP, is just an extra I.O. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's just no, one I.O. because they're writing a whole stripe. One I.O. <laughs> oh, okay. when you read, it's a log you basically goes file. here. When you write, you basically take a new one and you write it there. Okay, yeah. So that's it. why that's the, that's the basic. But there's garbage collection. Yeah, so the, in, the, the cost is garbage collection, but yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks. So that you can see that with a kilobyte uh, block size and the 100% random address, 7 to 3 rewrite ratio, the cost for the performance for RE5, 6, and TP, they are the same. We also have ma many things here which we optimize on the layout side. For example, when we're looking at a particular write or implementation, doesn't aware the SSD layout. What happens is the user writes comes in. <coughs> this is a time that the write happens. So when you're looking at the write, which realize on the drive, it will be looking like something like this because the writes are mixed within each block. Here, each block is a flash erase block. That can be very large. Then, when we do the array level GC, the, the typical method is pick the highest one with garbage percentage, with the highest garbage percentage. For example, 94, 95, 93. Here, when we're trying to garbage collect them, we move it somewhere else. Then when you're looking at from dry perspective, <coughs> we issue the trim to those blocks. The dry we are looking at something like this. So this way the dry will still have to do some work to move the data around. So if we have a GC which aware the SSD layout, what could happen is something like this. Data happens, data right here. Now, when we pick the, the blocks we are trying to garbage collect at array level, not only we're we looking at the garbage percentage, we're looking, <coughs> also looking at the time that the blocks adjacent to each other, the, the blocks adjacent to each other in time. Then we can pick those three. When we look at the drive, well, after we issue the trim command, it will be looking like this. Then we have a whole flash erased block which can be reused. <coughs> so this is one data layout optimization we, we can use. The other one is the multi-stream SSD. <coughs> because the, the drive we're using is, uh, uh, is our own drive. Uh, so we can actually have this. Uh, before everyone else is actually jumping into the uh, multi-stream one. So looking at the standard SSD, when the data we realize and we observe, data can have different lifespans. So for example, the red one here have a small, let's say, short lifespan. The data with blue have a um, longer lifespan. What this means is if we don't do any kind of optimization. When you write to the SSD with standard SSD, what happens is when you look at the drive particular block, after time t, this, the block so as far as the lifespan is concerned, you're keeping sort of a heat map of block updates? Uh, currently, 
we, I need to, to confirm, but I don't believe. So, um, so I guess the question would become, how do you know that some block has a short lifespan versus a longer lifespan at the time that you're creating the stripe, right? So I can give you some hint, like, um, for example, the, some data we know that the metadata will have shorter lifespan. Uh, some journals will have life, um, life, um, uh, shorter lifespan. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, some data which you already garbage collect went wrong and is still alive, they have a longer lifespan, those kind of ways without getting into specifics. Okay. But you're not writing it. The writing, the lifespan means you either delete or you've been overwritten. So the, inter the, the interval between the two events for a particular LBA, that's the lifespan. So when you're looking at a particular time t, which all the shorter lifespan data is expired, looking at the drive or the flash blocks, you can see that they are everywhere. So reclaim them will cost more, trying to move the data around to get. So when you have multi-stream SSD, what you can do is we put all the blocks into the one stream, the longer ones into other stream, even longer ones into other stri streams, so that when the block with short lifespan expired, we have a whole <coughs> flash block ready to be used. So this means the drive will do less work when copying data wrong. Okay? When you say a multi-stream SSD, or multi stream SSD versus a standard SSD. These are ones are, that you're making, right? You're, you're uh, we're making this. Right. Mu uh, multi stream SSD. The one that you show, right. you, you have there, it's, it's capable of multi streaming. So is the, are you talking to it through, say, NVMe, through multi -que multiple queues, like the 64 queues of NVMe, or is it different than that? It's a different concept than the multi queue. Multi queue means the interface, how much you can actually utilize on the interface level, so pump to mm -hmm. uh, different queues. This one means you can somehow tag different address to a different where I think the drive should understand. Mm -hmm. Then it will be put differently. So it's two concepts. Oh, it's a different area, okay. Different area. I'm still, yeah. I'm still confused on your comment about how you said, you know, how do you know when the data is being written, you think you need whether it's going to have a short or a long lifespan? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the collection and if you're moving data, but three thirty. How do you know? How do you know? You're saying you get a right amplification reduction, but I mean, the data you don't, the, the array is not aware of what the data is, or the disks aren't. Array aware. actually knows when looking at it. We we can. First, we know that no. metadata and data. He's Those are two data. separate okay. things. So and Array knows what is journal and what is not. not. Go so, the, and also so the actual user data would be what you would consider the long lifespan data and your, the, the your user metadata. Data I have the two categories. First thing is before <coughs> my G Array actually doing one round of GC, they are gone. Uh -huh. means they are relatively yeah. short lifespan. Um, or versus some other data which um, after one round of GC, they're still there. So you need to copy forward, which, which means in that sense, they're actually, their lifespan is longer. So you're moving, so you're, it, it's not just the new data that you're writing in this example, it's, it's the, the maintenance of the data that's already Yeah, because there. the way that we use uh, read, direct, and write, we also have garbages, if you're looking at this one. Here, the, the green ones are garbages, means those three 
are not garbages. They need to be copied forward when we do the array level GC. And those will be have longer lifespan compared to, let's say, three here. So that's why we can, we know. So we might need yeah, we don't, not currently we are not know. actually remembering a heat map. He's, mm. He has oh. 10 slides. So, I mean, garbage collection is an ongoing activity that's happening all the time. As you're, as you're writing new stripes, you're collecting old stripes and trying to free them up at the same time. It's not like you have a separate, you know, activity, which is just doing garbage collect collection distinct from being data written. So, it is a background process and it's happening all the time. It's just, we only do that one thing. We think that the, 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 the yeah. space is um, but you're creating new play. stripes all the time for new yeah. data that comes in. Right. It's possible that you could actually be collecting data at the same time, garbage collecting at the same time, and you could take some of those longer lived uh, blocks and uh, incorporate them with a newer stripe if you wanted to. You're right. You're right. Yep. That's possible. Yeah, that's possible. But then it's actually. Uh, mix the new writes with longer living ones. That's yeah. actually the purpose of that. Um, of trying to optimize Yeah, it. trying to actually separate them. Hmm. So right. then I will going to present the test results. Before we go there, I'm going to show why we choose a particular compression ratio and dedupe ratio. So we have five column groups here. Each column group representing a particular data with different compress, compression ratio. For example, this one means we have compression completely disabled, regardless of the data. This, we have uncompressible data, means compression ratio is one to one. We have compression ratio two to one, three to one, and four to one. These are with, different data patterns. This is just different input data. Yeah. Then within each, within each column group, we have different bars. The first bar, the, 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 the blue bar, means we disable the dedupe. Regardless of the dedupe ratio of the input data, we just turn off the dedupe ability of the array. Then the first, the, the, the red bar we have here is the undedupable data, <coughs> then the dedupe ratio 2 to 1 and 3 to 1. So you can see from here that this is our lowest performing point. So that's why we choose this as our all future slides showing. So we do have global deduplication like we said before. The numbers you can see here is we're trying to limit the latency to be one millisecond across, then which push the I.O. To, to check the maximum IOPS. So here we can see the overhead is about 18%. <coughs> because we do redirect on right to, to have snapshots, the so snapshots is relatively free for us. But you can see here, with same test configuration, it's basically we don't have any performance yeah. loss yeah. at all. We also have active, active metro. Here we do our optimization is the optimistic locking. Means we, um, we assume we get a lock always. Then if we have an issue, then we back off. So as we can see here, the same configuration test scenario. We have overhead of 16%, but still with all that, we still manage to achieve 280,000 IOPS. <clears throat> we also scale out to the point to, 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 to achieve high performance. When you look at the particular controller and the resource sharing part of it, these are the non and cache, they are local processes. They actually account for about 20% of all the CPUs. The rest, inline deduplication, inline compression, as well as read, stripe, system GC, multi-stream, all this 
are fully leveraging the global resource across all controllers. This accounts for about 80% of the cores. So, so currently <coughs> we have uh, two engine, one and two engines and four controllers. We can see the scale ratio is around 92%. <coughs> And uh, as um, as uh, uh, we discussed before, each NUN can be optimized, configurable, optimized, configurable as uh, IOPS optimized versus uh, bandwidth optimized. And with our QS support, we can guarantee the performance of each. Then we can share the same pool down below. So here we can see the uh, performance numbers, which we can achieve the rerun mixed of 330,000 IOPS with two controllers, and IOPS is 12 gigabyte per second for reads and 6 gigabyte for writes.